Hi, everyone. We hope you're staying healthy and safe today. Uh, we're so happy to have you joining us for our Careers in Health Psychology panel. We have five wonderful panelists and professionals with us today who hopefully, um, I'm sure, are going to give us a lot of guidance on how psychology intersects with health in a lot of different ways. And how this came about is a little bit biased on my part. I took a health psychology course as an undergrad many years ago, and I feel it's a very neglected area of psych. So we're going to hopefully uh, today expose you to how psychology intersects with health, maybe a little bit about wellness, stress management. Um, again, we have a very diverse panel here with us today representing a broad career path. So before we get started, we want to introduce ourselves, our, the, our hosts today, my, myself as one of the hosts. My name is Steve Young. I'm an advisor in the psychology department here at Maryland. I work a lot with careers and internships, and we're going to allow our co-host right now to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I am Michelle Sloan. I am the Assistant Director of Special Events and Career Programs in the BSAS Feller Center for Advising and Career Planning. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. So we have just a couple reminders as we get started here. This is a panel format. So again, we have five professionals, five panelists with us. So we do want to give them all equal time. So we hope that you'll have questions for all, all of them throughout our session. And speaking of questions, we do have a Q&A box available. And we do hope to hear from you throughout the webinar that you can put your type your questions in the Q&A box for our panelists. We do have some prepared questions that we'll get started with and we'll kind of segue back and forth. We'll try to get to your questions that you might, ha might have as a participant in this webinar. We do want to remind everyone as well that this webinar is being recorded today and we want to be able to share this webinar with students and participants who were not able to be here today. So with that being said, we're gonna get started with obviously our first question is for, our, for all of our panelists. If you can uh, take, a, take a moment or two to briefly introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit about your current position, what you do. We can start with, we can go on down the row here, I guess. We can start with Miles. Go ahead, Miles. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Miles Davenport. I am an alumni of University of Maryland. I graduated with my bachelor's of kinesiology in 2017. I'm currently a master's of public health student um, with a concentration in health policy analysis and evaluation. Um, currently, I kind of have two jobs. I'm an intern with the FDA. A, as a student trainee, and um, I'm a HIPAA analyst with Lidos um, with a contract under um, HHS. Um, and my answer for the first question, can you remind me, Steve, what, what is the first question again? I'm sorry, I don't have the, the questions pulled up. Oh, no, it was just, you, you have it there. So just kind of okay. introducing yourself a little bit about your background, uh, what your current position is, a little bit about your current position and what you mm. do in your current position. Okay. Uh, uh, well, as a as a HIPAA analyst, um, that's my full-time job, I'm responsible for reviewing um, cases, complaints across the United States, um, alleging violations against um, HIPAA, the HIPAA Act. Um, so for instance, if you, you, know, you walk into your doctor's office and you feel like there's some um, violation against your privacy or security, you can file a formal complaint with that organization or you can file a complaint um, through the federal government um, with the Department of Health and Human Services, and that would come to the Office of Civil Rights. Um, and that's kind of where I work within the Office of Civil Rights. We receive all these complaints that come in by mail, by, um, by phone, by fax, uh, most, mostly through our online portal. And we just um, triage them. And if they are, a, if they are um, an a, a eligible complaint, we process them. If they're not, um, then we close them out as um but not investigating. So that's pretty much what I do on, on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, thank you so much, Miles. And next we have Belinda. 
Hey, everybody. Um, my name's Belinda Greenfield. Um, I work for New York State government. Um, um, the agency is Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. And um, my, I have kind of two jobs um, <laughs> um, doing these multitasking. I'm, I'm Bureau Director of Adult Treatment Services. And what I do there is um, basically oversee um, projects that help to improve quality in um, addiction treatment. Um, basically really trying to, you know, I I improve the, the patient or client's experience um, as it relates to getting help with um, addiction problems and, and coming up with different types of strategies and then, you know, really helping the, the whole entire state to adopt them. Um, and then secondly, I'm what's called the New York State Opioid Treatment Authority or SOTA, not the soda we drink, but the SOTA kinds. Um, and there's kind of one of us in every state in the country that has um, what most people are familiar with is called uh, methadone treatment programs, but um, the, the newer term is opioid treatment programs because we don't want to just focus the lens on methadone. We really want to talk about that there. Um, we, the, all the counseling, wellness services, peer support services that go in line with, um, with helping people with opioid addiction. Um, and in, in that role, I basically act as a regulatory overseer of the state regulations that OTPs or opioid treatment programs have to follow, but also on the federal level. I, I work with SAMHSA. Um, which is the, let me see if I get this right, right. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, S-A-M-H-S-A, -S -A. Um, and the DEA, um, Drug Enforcement Agency, I also work with. Um, so, um, and I'm kind of the go-between, between, between the feds and the treatment programs that are, are delivering method on treatment program services. Um, and, and kind of they're making sure that the other programs stay in line do what they need to do, but also offer technical assistance around any sort of treatment um, issues. So that's kind of what my current, you know, job is. I, I actually also do teach. Um, I teach master level um, counseling students um, that are either going for um, um, school counseling, mental health counseling, or rehabilitation counseling. And basically, the, the, my educational experience is predominantly with a rehab counseling lens. And rehabilitation counseling is about helping people with disabilities um, become as self-sufficient, um, as independently functioning as possible. And I always specialized um, in behavioral health sciences. So I worked in the mental health side and in the addiction side. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about me right now. Thank you, Belinda. Yumbika, if I'm mispronouncing your name, please let me know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Hi, everyone. I'm Yumbika Mather. And at Maryland, I was a double major in neurophys and psychology. And after that, I did a fellowship at the National Institute of Mental Health, so NIMH, where I worked in a lab that focused on anxiety. And then after that, I went to Penn State for a master's degree in biobehavioral health. And over there, I also did some teaching. And for a year and a half, I've been working at Child Trends, which is located in Bethesda, but currently working from home. And Child Trends is a mission-driven organization. So it's focused on research that improves the lives of children and youth. So what we do is we write proposals so that we can work on projects that are funded by government agencies, other foundations, and then we work on the projects. So we do the research for the project, things like data collection, analysis, writing, we put out briefs and fact sheets that are really relevant to other people in the space who work with kids. And so I'm really excited to be on this panel today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Kate, go ahead. So hello, I'm Kate McGraw. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. Um, I've had an unusual career path, which I'm happy to explain later. But currently, I was just detailed this week to work on the president's task force to end suicide in the United States. And um, I'm not really sure what that role is gonna entail since I'm brand new to that job, but I, I recently left the role of directing the Psychological Health Center of Excellence. And so I am a Department of Defense civilian employee having served for a number of years in uniform for the Air Force. And we, um, we look at psychological health needs for the military, for veterans, for family members. 
um, across all diagnostic categories. We look at policy and research, and we really try to address gaps where we find them and make sure that folks are getting the best quality care that they can. And that's me. Thank you so much for your service, Kate. Uh, last but not least, we have Kathy. Yeah, hi there, everybody. Uh, well, I went to Maryland in the 80s, um, bachelor's in kinesiology, and then also my master's in exercise physiology. And right after grad school, I worked at Marriott for a number of years in corporate fitness, and then also corporate wellness, a little bit broader about stress management and nutrition and things like that. And after being in corporate wellness for a while, I worked in senior wellness at a retirement community where the average age was 85. So what I've done after I left working in the retirement community is kind of draw the two together. So there's so much that we can do in our younger years to age more healthfully. And so kind of my, my latest book, I wrote a book when I was um, younger called The Busy Mom's Ultimate Fitness Guide. Um, and then now just last year, my latest book, Boom, is about what I learned in, with working with seniors and how younger people can take advantage of those lessons learned about how we can age as healthfully as possible. So <clears throat> in my business now, I do um, public speaking webinars and presentations for different organizations and national associations related to wellness and healthy aging. And I do coaching, uh, a little bit of personal fitness training and, and things like that and building an online course on how people can kind of get back on the track for for healthy lifestyles. And I'm really excited to be here today because psychology is a huge part of this. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, we, we know that if it was as simple as eat healthy and exercise, we'd all be, we'd all be doing it. Like, why aren't we doing it? Right. It's, it, there's so much that has to do with our mindset. So that's why I'm happy to be here today. Amazing. I need your book, Boom, <laughs> desperately right now. Thank you all so much for those wonderful introductions. We're going to stop sharing right now. And so everyone can see you a little bit better here. So thank you again for those introductions. Wonderful. So our first question is kind of, if you can talk a little bit about a typical day for you in your position and what that entails, maybe the rewards and challenges of your daily work. And anybody can jump in to start. I, I, I can maybe jump in. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. Um, lots of meetings <laughs> is my day. My, 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 my day is literally um, back to back meetings, typically from um, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and I'm eating on the go. Um, there, there, there's no lunch hour. <laughs> that, that, that is, is my day. Um, the, the meetings are, are the, and it, it's basically all policy driven conversations, you know, trying to figure out ways in which to in, in, improve what we're doing regulatorily as well as clinically. Um, I, 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 it's constantly shifting um, a, a focus. Um, and it, it can involve presentations, like actually earlier this morning, I did um, a presentation for our, uh, one of our um, state um, the conferences. Um, you know, but, but also the conversations run the gamut from other government people to treatment providers, um, to consumers, to, to people that, um, um, that are receiving services. Um, so it, it, a lot of diversity in, in, in what the dialogue is um, and the, the rewards are, it keeps me on my toes. There is never a boring day. Um, the challenge is that there is never a boring day. Um, I, I wish sometimes I get so excited when I have a, 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 a span of time where I don't have a meeting. I'm like, oh, that's great. Now I can get to do like other things like emails. Um, but, um, but, but all in all, I, I think the rewards far outweigh um, um, the challenges. Um, it's, it's, it, to me, it's very exciting to always kind of be moving and that's kind of my energy anyway. So that's me. I, I can jump in. Um, I, I can tell you what I was doing, which is very similar to what Belinda just described, um, leading a very large agency with lots of scientists looking at research, editing papers, 
responding to um, requests for more information from federal agencies and Congress and the media. And so all that's a part of the day. A large part was spent mentoring um, junior uh, scientists, researchers, and clinicians. Um, and then not a lot of time to think, which was kind of the disadvantage. Um, in the current role right now, I'm just preparing for this new role. So I'm reading a 300 page document, trying to wrap my brain around what it is that, that um, the Prevents Task Force is working on. Um, so, but, but m mostly um, I've moved away from the clinical care delivery realm and more into the research and policy realm over the last 10 years. And so that's been a real challenge. Um, I'll jump in next that my day always starts with exercise, which is um, uh, a good way to start the day early morning. I'm an early morning person, never used to be, but um, I find that that's the only way to fit certain things in before the day gets away from you. And I'll also say that <clears throat> right now I'm actually doing something else full time. I'm working for Montgomery County Government Department of Recreation with the seniors team, but I'm not here to talk about that because I'm here to talk about the entrepreneurial stuff I'm trying to build to become full time. <clears throat> employment. So what, when I'm on my entrepreneurial days, it's all about what conferences do I need to apply to speak at? Do I need to create a PowerPoint presentation? Am I working on, you know, my social media presence, those types of things. So it's really about um, following up with, let's say certain speaking gigs, certain companies who I know would have a good fit for my topic and how I can partner with them. Right now I have a pharmaceutical company and a high school that have both reached out to me about wellness programming for their populations. And this morning I filmed a little um, 20 minute presentation for the Healthcare Business Women's Association. So for instance, that, you know, it takes up the time of preparing the presentation, getting the AV ready, doing the actual shoot, making sure you edit it afterwards, do the social media so people know you actually did it. So just, you know, there's little different stages. And so, um, but it's, um, it's exciting. And I think, but, you know, when you're passionate about what you're doing, then it kind of fuels you. I'll chime in real quickly. Um, some of the rewards that I feel like I have uh, working um, as a contractor is just um, actually, first of all, being, like, I feel like I'm lucky to be able to work in, to, in the field that I enjoy. Um, a lot of times, I'm, I'm not relatively fresh out of college. I'm graduating in 2017, but I still feel like I am still somewhat fresh out of college in the sense that um, there are a lot of college students who are still struggling trying to find um, a job in their career field. And uh, for me, I feel like I am blessed to be able to do that, number one. And number two, uh, given that we're in this time of the pandemic, it's a lot of people are struggling. Um, financially and trying to find a job um, and even if they are working it may not be something that they enjoy so um, I, I find my my job is very rewarding in that sense um, and I get to learn a lot um, as a contractor there um, are plenty of uh, opportunities to grow and being a contractor there are a lot of opportunities that I can see working directly um, with the government so um, that's just a word for those who are interested in working in the government or just as a contractor, there's always opportunities that will come your way. And the door is always endless. I think that's a good segue for me. I'm also a contractor because um, Child Trends is a contract research organization. So basically our work depends on the funds that we get from the government agencies and from foundations to do the research. So like I described before, a lot of research tasks, like the things that you would do in an undergrad lab, like collect data, manage a project, write, that's all that's all good and you know the rewards are that it can feel really impactful compared to some of that lab work like you're directly connecting with different stakeholders like organizations and networking and also you write these you know fact sheets and briefs that go to policymakers or you know child care agencies and things like that um, one of the challenges is the funding can be really tight so we can't do a lot of work if we don't get a lot of money to do it so that can be one of the challenges, especially as a junior career person, to really grow and you know excel and have a niche of what you'd like to learn. But overall, it is um, you know really rewarding. And when I have some downtime, I I still try to work on some papers, like scientific papers from graduate school. And my research interests there were on resilience to stress. So that's something that I still like to you know dabble in and you know get get my name out there, get my work out there, and also you know networking as well. Resilience, I think we all could use that right now. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing. 
Uh, don't forget our participants, our student participants. We have the Q&A box, so we want to hear from you. So please drop your questions in there. We'd love to hear from you. So our next question is kind of reflecting back a little bit as to how you got to where you are right now <laughs> in your career. And we don't, we don't want to give the long version of your resume, but were there, were there specific experiences you maybe had as an undergrad yourself when you look back on them that helped you evolve into, into your professional, helped you kind of define your professional demeanor or for professional sense of yourself? And what were those experiences, whether it was maybe an internship or a mentor that you had in, in college? Uh, if you can maybe just share a little bit about that, what what were some, I don't want to say monumental experiences, but what gave you the spark? What were those spark experiences that maybe helped you define your where you're at today? I could take a stab. Um, <laughs> um, I, 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 for me, um, actually changing majors was uh, was for me a pivotal piece. Um, and, and I say this to those of you listening because we, we, we freak out about, we've got to make these amazing life um, decisions and we may not be equipped to do that, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and honestly, even if I looked at my trajectory, which is a, a long trajectory <laughs> professionally, it's moved in so many different places. So I think my, I, I, for this group, I would say um, I, I was a science major. Um, sort of looked disparagingly at anything behavioral health related because that was kind of beneath us as a science person. Um, and I denied myself the ability to consider psychology because I thought that it wasn't as fruitful. And I spent a year and a half to almost two years doing a major that was very unfulfilling. And when I finally had this aha moment of what the hell am I doing? Um, I let me revisit my original passion, which was psychology. And I took um, two psycho um, psychology courses. I got A's and it was the most amazing thing. And, and so for me, that's my aha moment is, 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 is being able to be honest with yourself about what is it that I want to do and make sure your interests are aligned with what your profession is, because at the end of the day, you're spending a boatload of time um, in doing what you do and you've got to be happy in it. Mm -hmm. So that's my takeaway. I hear a real follow your passion team from you. <laughs> <laughs> you feeling it? <laughs> yeah. Feeling it. yeah. I would say the tip that I have that's, that's somewhat related is when I was an undergrad, I did so many internships. I, I followed around so many people, anybody who I admired their career path, I would call them up and ask them, hey, will you spend some time with me on the phone? Or can I you know, shadow you for a day? And I learned so much because most people really want to help students. I would love to help any of you who are listening, you know, or, or have a chat with you um, and you know, just kind of let you learn more about, about what I'm doing. And most people feel the same way. It, you just need to ask. So it kind of feels awkward to ask, but you just, you just need, need to, to get out there and do it. And I also wanted to say that some of the most exciting things and most, most um, the best moves that happened with me in my career were strange things out of the blue that I wasn't expecting. So those are the things you never know when something is going to suddenly be great. When my first book um, came out, I was working this health fair. I didn't really want to do it. I was there representing, you know, something I wasn't that excited about. And the person in the booth next to me was a writer for the Washington Post. And he ended up, because we had time just chatting, he ended up asking me about my book and he reviewed my book in the Washington Post because he didn't have anything to write about the next week. So, I mean, it's, it's just like these things happen that, that, you know, you never know what's around the next corner. So take that leap, you know, nothing happens in your comfort zone, all that stuff, you know. Um, I just heard this quote from Barbara Streisand of all people is that fear is the energy behind doing your best work. So I don't know if she actually is the one that said it, but someone said she said that. <laughs> 
<laughs> and who is Barbara Streisand? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, she's older than me too. My mom is older. Her. I don't know who she is. The students probably <laughs> don't. You're right. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like, you know, one theme I take from you, Kathy, is chance encounters can actually matter too. You know, everything we do want to take purp purposeful actions and make purposeful decisions related to um, our career development, but it sounds like too chance encounters when you talked about being next to the Washington Post writer, that might have been somewhat of a chance encounter that really helped you in a lot of ways. So yeah, it really happen good. if you don't put yourself out there. You know, if you don't, if you're not getting out there and making connections and trying to meet people and do stuff, you're not going to have the chance encounters. Yeah, I thank you. I totally agree with that. And um, I ha I've had, like I said earlier, I've had a very unusual life life history. I went to music school as an undergraduate, um, piano performance that had nothing to do with psychology and uh, put a lot of time and energy into that. That was one of my dreams when I was little and decided after I graduated that that was not the career for me. Um, and I went to a, a career counseling center and got tested. And at the very bottom of my aptitude was the military and at the top was social sciences. And my brother convinced me to join the military. And so I ended up as a missile officer, which has absolutely nothing to do with either one of those things, but it was a pathway. And I think, you know, the lesson that I learned is if you, if you stick with something long enough, um, you will eventually get there if that's what you really want to do. So it was more about perseverance and self-discipline. And it took me several years to, um, to get the background I needed to be competitive to get into a clinical psychology program, but eventually I did. And, and then the rest of my career, I've just kind of applied that, that idea that if you just do your best work wherever you go, then good things will happen. And so that's what's happened with me. And I do agree that you should just keep your heart and your mind open to whatever possibilities come your way because you never know um, if you don't take that risk or if you don't take that path, um, you might be missing out on a really awesome adventure, for sure. I agree with everything that everyone has said so far about internships and just being open and thankfully we have LinkedIn and Terrapin Connect, even though, you know, we can't really interact with people at conferences right now, but I was actually pre-med, like undecided about pre-med when I was an undergrad. So I did like the lab work, I did the shadowing of doctors and all of that just to help me decide what I wanted to really do. And then, so I'd really, you know, thumbs up to the internships and just one thing about me too is everything I did I think I took a piece of it to the next thing on my resume so when I worked at NIH I was working in anxiety and humans and then I wanted to add that health component so that's why I went to Penn State to get that extra graduate degree and so that's what I would say too is you know try to have a coherent story with your career and I think then you'll ultimately you know end up where you want to be like everyone is talking about like following your passion. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off of what everyone um, mentioned. Um, I, I don't know, Kathy, if you can relate to this studying kinesiology. Um, I, for, I personally thought I was going to be a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of building my resume to pursue this dream of physical therapy. So I, I worked at a physical therapy office as an aide for three years in high school and had a whole bunch of volunteer hours. But um, I was able to uh, get this uh, internship um, in college. And it was a public health internship, but at the same time, I still had some ability to focus on some physical therapy aspects of things. However, in that internship, I met hundreds of people from across the United States who had different passions in public health, some doctors, some different, different professions. And that just opened my eyes to the limitless opportunities that there are in the field of public health. And eventually, I just kind of stopped looking at physical therapy as uh, and all and, and started just looking at physical therapy as, I'm sorry, looking at public health as a whole uh, as a career to get into. Um, but it, I, it wouldn't have been that way if it weren't for applying myself um, and seeking internships. So I would definitely recommend um, finding and trying out as many internships as you can. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, Miles, it's figuring out what we don't want, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those experiences can really help us help shape uh, our decisions in terms of what uh, area we don't want to maybe go into. Michelle, it sounds like we have some questions from our, our participants. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I'm muted. Okay. 
Um, what experiences, skills, and undergrad help prepare you for these careers? And I see Belinda has a mark that she would like to start. Oh, okay. And I was going to try to type it. <laughs> um, I, I, honestly, I was just going to say everything. Um, I, I, I think I think that the, the, that you know, exposing yourself to all of the possibilities, clubs involvement. Again, we talked about internships um, uh, amongst the panel, um, and, and 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 diversity in thinking about the different things that will inform you and educate you. Um, it, it, nothing's wasted. No time is wasted in whatever we're learning. Um, it, 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 it becomes a part of who we are and it informs um, not only decisions, but our, our, our lens on the world. So th th that, that was kind of going to be my very general basic answer. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that too. Just the classes that you take, like we were just talking about, like what really interests you? Like what's a, a class that you enjoy studying for or like reading a book if you're a nerd like me, <laughs> you know, like something you would actually really enjoy. And then that really means something that you know, I really like this class over that class. And then skills wise, like in those lab classes, you can gain a lot of those research type of skills or people interaction. And so I think that undergrad really sets you up well, whether you go on directly into the workforce or you go on for graduate school or do both like a lot of us have so I would say that again like nothing is wasted and you can really you know see what really speaks to you um, in your whole time in undergrad and I'd add being a self-advocate learning to to say what you need to say ask what you need to ask I forgot to mention earlier that right now I'm an adjunct professor at Montgomery College and I teach stress management and also personal health and fitness there and you know, when, when you have a class, right now my class size is only 20, but very quickly you can tell which people actually are reading what you put on the portal, which ones are actually doing the work and who's just skating through and not really doing what they're supposed to do. And then when you get to the workforce, it's the same way. People are either doing what they're supposed to do and, you know, and being on top of things or they're not. And if you're not, if someone gets an F on a test and doesn't turn into things and then just thinks, oh, well, I'll just take the zero, I mean, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to be the one who says, reach out to your professor. What can I do to, you know, how can I get back on track? What are the skills that, you know, just really trying to always take that next step and realize that nobody really cares about your grades as much as you. And same thing with your career. Nobody's going to care about pushing you forward as much as you yourself. Like you, it's how you position yourself. That's going to be, um, you know, the most important thing for, for going forward in your career. Okay, I can move on to the next question. This is submitted from Matt Wheeler. He said he graduated in 2018 and was interested in therapy and counseling side of psychology, but I'm not sure where to start. Do you have any advice for someone looking for something in this field with a family science SPH background? Um, I can try to answer that being a clinical psychologist. I can tell you that um, insurance drives a lot of what happens out in the treatment sector of psychology. And so there are certain educational requirements that are necessary before you can actually do therapy um, with the general public. And um, so if you're, if you're wanting to go into that field, I would strongly recommend you consider going into graduate school to either get a social work degree or to get um, a, an additional degree in psychology or potentially a doctorate in psychology, either counseling or clinical. Um, but there are other ways to practice without doing the graduate work. So for example, an LPC is not required, a licensed um, professional counselor is not required to have an, a graduate degree per se. And so there might be ways that you could um, leverage your current education without having to go to graduate school, but but the, the um, expected uh, path would be to get a graduate degree and then get a license, which is governed by state law. And there's all these things you have to do in order to be able to, to treat people for, for both your protection and for their protection. Yeah, I was going to piggyback on what Kate was saying, um, you know, um, at the undergraduate level, the best option is trying to get some sort of certification credential, um, I, I, you know, within the substance use disorder field. Um, and I know I'm 
thinking specifically about New York State, but um, we have a credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselor. Um, and, and, and that really allows you and give, provides that entree in to do counseling um, and start to build your you know, clinical repertoire. And then, and then you can maybe decide later um, you know, to continue, but definitely greater flexibility and, and options are available as you move along in, in, in becoming more educated. So, okay, great. So the next question, how do you recommend seeking people um, to shadow during the pandemic? LinkedIn. That's a, that's a difficult question to answer only because it's not clear like what kind of shadowing you want to do. Um, so for some types of of um, work in the field of psychology, it might be possible to do it virtually, but for other types like seeing patients, probably not. Um, so I think it depends on what you're really looking at. And I think LinkedIn's great. If you, if you can make connection with somebody that um, maybe is working in the area that you like, just send them an email and ask them to chat. And I've done that with people that have reached out to me. So I think that's a great idea. And I would add that in addition to Shadowing, you could also consider more informational interviewing, like I think Kathy was talking about before. So you send that LinkedIn note, and I think people are very receptive to that. So just talking about what you do, even if you can't go to a clinic or go, like you said, to the lab and see how people work day to day, but then you can maintain that connection with the person when hopefully you can, you know, be next to them in person and see what their you know, day to day is really like. Okay, so the next question, um, why is it so common to hear that we can't get jobs with a psychology degree and how can we avoid becoming the stereotype ourselves, especially during this current type time? Um, I can only answer just from the perspective of having been a director of an agency that hired a lot of people with undergraduate degrees in psychology. I don't know that it's the degree necessarily. It might be um, the position that you're applying to or the skill set that you bring to the table in addition to your degree. I, I see the, the degree in psychology as a really great um, background for an entry level position in a, in a government agency. Mm -hmm. I think just seeking out additional um, education and connections because uh, I mean, even though I, was, I wasn't a psychology major, I think um, I ran into the same thing thinking, gosh, there's no jobs waiting for called a kinesiologist for a bachelor's in kinesiology. So what can I do to set myself apart? What can I do? So I went on to get my master's, but then I also sought out certain certifications or associations to belong to. So whatever you can do that kind of brings um, you know, more specificity and more credentials to the areas that, that you're most passionate about. I would agree with that too. And I think that I also felt that same feeling like, what can I do with psychology that I have to do graduate school so that I can specialize in something. But I think that the flip side of that too is that psychology is so broad. So you see people at places like Deloitte, for example, who have psychology degrees and they maybe go on to do industrial organizational psychology. So I think that we tend to think of psych as like clinical and counseling and that and cognitive and that side of things, but there's just so much that you can do with psychology. And like we were saying before, you know, you can get a job and see how that feels, or you can go straight to school. I think that kind of the flip of that stereotype is that psychology can really feed into so many different career paths. Okay, so our next question is, what is the job market like for careers in health psychology? Do you think there's a lot of demand for them? I can say yes, definitely in the military. It's a really big field. Um, lots of health psychologists. We have integrated psychologists working in primary care clinics. We focus on health and wellness and performance psychology. So there's a lot of application in the D Department of Defense for sure. And that's a beneficiary population of nine, nine million or more. So um, from that agency standpoint, I'd say, yeah. I would say in the addiction field, um, you know, it, it, the lens is is not exclusively focused or, or solely focused on helping people to stop using substances. Um, um, but it's also about wellness and and considering the whole person. 
um, and, and there's a greater focus on, you know, that more comprehensive lens as to, you know, the person's just general well-being um, and nutrition and meditation, um, you know, so many other aspects of treatment are being brought into um, the addiction treatment field. So um, I, I think that there's definite um, connection there. Okay, thank you. So the next question is for Miles. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, about what it means to be a student trainee? Okay, sure. Um, I realized I didn't uh, touch on that when I introduced myself. Um, so my role as a student trainee with FDA is fairly new. I just started uh, mid-August. Um, and for the most part, as a trainee, I'm responsible for transcribing data um, that tobacco manufacturing um, companies submit um, to the FDA for new products that they're um, trying to put on the market. So um, companies will submit an application that has information relating to a previous product, product that they have on the market, and they might have a new product that they're trying to put on the market. Um, and in this application, they there's a lot of specific, um, like, quantification quantifying information that needs to be translated so that the chemistry and the engineering uh, teams can um, use to do their review. So that's that's essentially what I'm doing. I'm transcribing um, data from these applications onto a spreadsheet so that the chemists and the engineers can use to um, conduct their uh, evaluations or reviews to either approve this application uh, for the for that manufacturing for that manufacturer to then put on the market. Okay, so for the next question, and for those of you who do advocacy or consulting with government officials, how receptive do you feel policymakers typically are? How big of an issue is bureaucracy in trying to make an impact? Well, 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 that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's like a simple answer to that. Um, being a government official and also doing consulting with other government officials, the bureaucracy is enormous. And my perception is at the level that I'm working that we have a lot of really well-intentioned people trying to make a difference and trying to develop programs and deliver programs that really make an impact and make a difference. But because it's so large, it's like a really complex machine. And then there are people at different levels that have different beliefs about how it should go. So I, I feel like the system itself sometimes is, is a barrier. And, and to, to echo that, um, yeah. Um, it, it, I sort of often see my role, even though I myself am a bureaucrat. <laughs> um, so on the one level, I can be perceived as the one that is seemingly intractable at times. Um, but but the reality is, is that, you know, advocacy really does help. And I also see my role as an advocate um, and, and trying to punch holes in the bureaucracy is to me what an effective person working in government is all about. Um, and so I, I try to keep that balance, um, but, but um, bureau bureaucratic um, you know, barriers are definitely real, um, but they shouldn't mean that we don't try. And, and so the, the, that would be my, my kind of recommendation is don't let that interfere with what the vision and what the goal is. You just have to keep you know, chiseling away at, at that at that bureaucratic structure. All right, so for the next question, have you ever experienced imposter syndrome when working in your fields in which you have felt that you did not belong in your job positions? If you have, how, have you, how did you navigate that feeling? I guess I could start with this. So I definitely had imposter syndrome when I was teaching my first class independently in graduate school. So I didn't have a PhD. You know, the students were like, who is this person? But I think that the first week, you know, you get used to them, they get used to you and you just know what you're talking about. So I think that confidence, like I know more about this than they do. So that really helped get over that feeling and really enjoy the experience. Um, so that's like the one example that comes to mind for imposter syndrome for me. I fortunately didn't feel it too much in my current job. So I'll let others speak to this. 
I can say that for me, every time I've had a promotion or moved up a level of responsibility, um, when I'm first starting out, I'm just like, well, what am I doing here? And is, am I going to be successful? And I, I think that you would be unusual if you didn't have some of those feelings, at least when you're beginning a new, new set of responsibilities. And I think the way that I get over it is just by acknowledging that I don't know enough at the moment and you know, turning to my team members to say, hey, I'm going to need your help to be successful here. Let's work together. And that's often worked well for me. I, 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 would, I would say just being present. Um, showing up is more than 50% of, of, um, of, of any task that you're assigned. Um, and, and, and yeah, and definitely acknowledging um, you, you, when we shouldn't be, we shouldn't feel that we're expected to be perfect, that we are all knowing. Um, so it's okay to say, I'm learning this, I need to understand this better. Um, actually asking questions and saying, I may not know the answer to a question that's being asked of me, but I'm gonna get back to you on it, speaks more volumes than having, you know, just seemingly being so erudite and so wonderful and amazing. Um, and, and, and so just not allowing that to stop you from taking that challenge, taking that next step, taking that promotion, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay, you will ride through it. Um, and in most instances, we, we really do amazingly well. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna wrap up with one last question. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of students are anxious, they're nervous about a lot of the things you mentioned about finding opportunities, being able to seek out opportunities and to really advance their, their brand, so to speak, their professional branding and such. If you have just like one quick piece of advice for them during the pandemic, uh, for us folks too in higher ed that advise students and, and work with students, it's sometimes challenging for us too when we're working to help students still find internships during this challenging time. Do you have any any thoughts on uh, any piece of advice regarding that? Mm -hmm. I, I do for sure. Um, first of all, get creative and get really good at Zoom, um, really good at video because you know it's one thing right in the beginning of the pandemic, but now that we know it's going on for a while, we know that virtual things are just going to keep increasing and increasing. <clears throat> People love being at home at least a little bit, you know, they don't maybe be totally at home, but so there's going to be an increased demand for virtual things. So if you can improve your professional uh, um, presence in a video situation, um, you know, for what your background is going to be, how you're going to dress, how you're going to present yourself so that you can stand apart from other people who might be trying to do the same thing um, as you virtually, virtual interviews, things like that. I would say um, just keep in mind nothing lasts forever, so this won't this will this will eventually end, and um, take advantage of of what it might offer you an opportunity to look inward or to gather a new skill of some kind or to continue to plan what your next step is going to be. Mm -hmm. I would say to answer that question is never give up. Um, I, for one, as a as a graduate student, I have to have an uh, internship course or have to internship in order to to graduate with my degree and i was struggling with trying to find an internship this summer um but i just kept on pushing kept on applying and luckily i was able to find one through the fda and um what i always try to tell other students is you know always reach out to your past connections if it's a from a from an internship that you did years ago or someone that you connected with recently um, always try to reach out to those people that you aspire to be like or are working in the field that you want to work in and try to see if there are any opportunities that are available for you to, to get in and get your feet wet or um, just let, like um, like everyone's saying, just be creative and try to just try to find something um, that no one else is doing, but always keep your eyes open. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for me, I would say from a, a counseling lens, um, telehealth 
um, and a telepractice ha has really been something that has had to happen and had to happen, you know, immediately um, w in response to the to the pandemic. Um, you guys are more equipped because you have some technological savvy um, as um, compared to some um, counselors and, and um, therapists that may be working in the field that really had never used these different platforms. They were woefully behind and more challenged. Um, so using that tech savvy and, 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 and thinking about what that future holds, um, not, the immediate, not only the immediate future now with um, um, the, the pandemic, but even post-pandemic. I mean, we're noting the, the remarkable attributes to being able to clinically connect with people even remotely. Um, and whereas many people kind of poo-pooed that and seemingly weren't really embracing it. So I say that to those of you that are going to be doing direct um, um, care, definitely, you know, exposing yourself to that. And that is something that can be utilized and can be a, a something that you participate in as interns or practicum students and the like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, don't let this time hold you back from planning for your career as you normally would be doing. So, for example, my organization is experiencing hiring freeze. However, we might have a need because people are so overworked because of the hiring freeze. So if you know, a fresh college student, college graduate, you know, emailed someone or was connected to one of us from LinkedIn, we might think like, oh, wow, yeah, we do need someone and we could figure out how to get this person in. And it might not be ideal pay or ideal tasks. But once you get your foot in the door, like some of us have said, it could turn into something really great. And again, with that LinkedIn and just trying to connect with people so that you're set up well, and hopefully this is over you know, someday. And from a mental health perspective, I would definitely expect us to have empathy towards the class of 2020, 2021, however many you know, years um, that students would be affected by this and all of their opportunities and goals that, that you all have right now. So we want to, that wraps up our, our webinar for this afternoon. We want to thank virtually, give all of our pa panelists an applause for such a wonderful job. The information you provided today is, is, really, is truly priceless. Uh, the students do not get this in their courses. So we really appreciate you sharing uh, all of your expertise, your guidance, your tips and insights. Very well done. We do have a slide here, folks, for you to follow up if you'd like to follow up with any of our panels today we have their contact information there we will be sending this out to you along with a recording of today's webinar so don't worry if you can't take a picture of it right now or anything like that we will make sure that we send it out to you we want to put in a couple plugs before you go um, with the university career center and the opportunities that are available for the University Career Center, careers.umd.edu. Um, I don't think enough students utilize this. So we hope that there are so many different events, Zoom events happening throughout the rest of the semester. And we have the intern for a day, but that, that I'm not sure that that's still going on, Crystal. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, it might still be happening. So that's a really good, opportunity. Somebody had mentioned like doing an informational interview. That's a really good opportunity for that. So the Career Center is doing a wonderful job during our virtual world to still uh, have host events, have programs, have services that are really helping you to develop uh, personally and professionally. We want to put in a plug for an upcoming event on November 5th, Thursday, November 5th. This will be an employer information session with Shepherd Pratt, which is a very large behavioral health system in the state of Maryland. They're gonna talk about career paths, internships, different things like that. So we have the link here, go.umd.edu slash Shepherd Pratt. So we hope that we'll see you uh, back for that Zoom event as well. Again, thank you to all the panelists today. We really appreciate your time and expertise and we wanna wish everybody a health and, and safe evening. Please take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye everybody. Bye Be everyone. Safe.